Good evening, everybody. I'm Kate Bush, head of Barbican Art Gallery. Um, I'm delighted to welcome you tonight to this very special event, which marks the opening of our <laughs> new exhibition, Everything Was Moving, Photography from the 60s and 70s. Since their collaboration began 15 years ago, they met working for Colors magazine in Italy. Adam Broomberg and Oliver Chinaran have been two of the most energetic and experimental artists working in photography in London. In books such as Ghetto, Mr. McKay and Chicago, as well as numerous exhibition projects, the most recent of which opened last night at Paradise Ray, so I urge everyone to go and check that out. Sadly, I haven't seen it yet. Um, Breenberg and Chinarin have consistently explored the representational possibilities of photography in its widest sense. Found images, rescued artifacts, the very materiality of film and paper feature in their work alongside powerful, <coughs> realist photographs. Last year, Adam and Ollie commissioned David Goldblatt and the novelist Ivan Vladislavich to make a project for their Krakow Photography Month, um, which some of you may be aware of. It was based around the idea of the alias. Two of South Africa's best known expatriate contemporaries have strangely never met South Africa's most famous photographer. So tonight we bring them together for the very first time. David Goldblatt will need very little introduction for most of you. One of the finest documentary photographers of the 20th and 21st centuries, Goldblatt is now at the beginning of his sixth decade of important work. He's made a life's project of extraordinary scope, which is being extended and added to all the time. He's constantly making new work, constantly on the move, and constantly innovating. I am really privileged to have him in this exhibition, and we're all very privileged to have him here tonight to share his thoughts with us. So please enjoy the discussion. I have to ask you um, to kindly turn off your mobile phones. There will be, I hope, lots of time at the end for questions. So um, one of my colleagues, I think Emma down here, will have the roving mic. Just please wait for the mic to get to you so that everyone can enjoy and share in your question. Thank you very much. Over to Adam. lovely introduction and for an extraordinary exhibition. Um, we just spent a few hours walking around and it's a humbling experience. Um, so it's a great honor to be here, sharing the platform with David, of course. Um, and we, we thought that we'd just like to start, um, or turn this on its head, and before looking at what the, the images that, that are in the exhibition, to look at some recent photographs that you've been working on. Um, and to try, and we'd be interested to try to understand how the person that took these pictures uh, took the pictures that are in the exhibition 50 years ago, and the connection between those photographs, but also those two people. Well, the connection is very simple. It's a straight line graph <laughs> from 1949 to uh, 2012. Um, thank you very much, and thank you, Kate, uh, and thank you, Adam and Ollie. I'll tell you briefly, very briefly, about a few photographs that I'm going to show you tonight. Um, in South Africa, we have a very high crime rate, and there are very few of us who have not been directly affected. Um, my wife and I have both been robbed by men with pistols in our house. I've been mugged several times, and this is a very common experience. We've been very lucky. We've escaped without violence. I, I felt I needed to do something that would relate to the crime rate uh, and, to, and to crime. Uh, I didn't want to go out with the police. I, there are colleagues who have done amazing work in that. I didn't want to go to the prison. Uh, Mikhail Sabotsky, a, a South African colleague, has done amazing photographs in prisons in South Africa. And I decided that I wanted to meet people who had committed offenses as ordinary people people you might meet in the supermarket or walking down the sidewalk. And so I then began on a series of photographs. And 
I wanted to do portraits of them, and I wanted to do portraits that in some way related to their crime, if there was a crime, or to what they were accused of. And I wanted to hear their stories. And so it began this series. Um, through various channels, mainly organizations dealing with uh, prisoners and rehabilitation and so on, I have met uh, a number of people who have been in trouble with the law, many of them have been in prison, and um, through uh, a connection in the quasi underworld, I've been meeting people. And the process is, I, I need to describe the process because it's quite important, very briefly. Um, Let's assume that Oli here has been in prison, he committed a, a theft. I invite him, I tell him, first of all, my interest. I'm interested in meeting you as somebody who's had a problem with the law and been in prison, perhaps. And I'm not interested in uh, making a, a grand statement out of your story, but I want to know something about you. I want to do a portrait at the scene of crime. That's very important to me. Something happened at that scene of crime that must have been, that was probably a life-changing experience. So I want to take you back to the scene of crime and do a portrait of you there. And then I want to uh, record your story. And as far as possible, I want you to tell it to me from the beginning, from childhood, right through prison experience and so on. So it's a very simple, basic process. I tell the, the uh, subject that I'm going to exhibit, I, I might exhibit and publish the work. I will ask the subject to sign a release allowing me to do this, and I will pay in South African uh, currency 800 rand to each subject to do this. I warn Oli that this could be dangerous for him at some stage. Perhaps one day he wants to get married or take a job and perhaps people concerned don't know his record. But it's out there, it's been exhibited, it's been published. So I warn Oli and I say to him, if you feel any hesitation, don't do this. And if he says, no, I, I'm not sure about it, then I say, well, leave it alone, and I walk away. If he agrees, however, then we go through this process, and I, it's very important to me that I make him understand that I'm not doing this in order to make some kind of um, dramatic uh, piece of journalism or photojournalism uh, out, of his, out of his life and story. And so I have made a public undertaking not to make any money out of this work. After paying gallery commissions, if there are any sales, uh, the balance is donated to an organization dealing with its offenders. So that is, that's the process. This man, Butch Blitz, uh, sorry, um, his, 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 his uh, nickname was Blitz. Blitz meaning lightning, because he was so fast with the knife. Uh, he was a criminal really from childhood, and uh, he was murdered shortly after I took this photograph. So I never got him to tell me his story. Um, eventually I tracked down his ex-girlfriend and got her to tell me a little. And uh, it, uh, it was a life of crime and of drugs and drink virtually from childhood until his end. Um, she told me that he had one way of, one thought about women, that he should be beaten in order to make them listen, and he used to beat her severely. Eventually she got a, a court interdict to prevent him from coming to her, but he disobeyed that and came to her mother's house where she was living, beat her up every night, and went off during the day. And so it went on until finally he was murdered. Um, he had robbed a drug baron and he was taken out. This young man, um, Errol Sebolodisho, uh, was caught shoplifting in his shop in Soweto, in Johannesburg. Uh, he had been relatively well off in the sense that he had a family that uh, cared for him. He was at school, learning a skill. Um, but the parents both died of natural causes, which might be a way of saying that they died of HIV AIDS related diseases. And his granny then uh, kept him. And 
unfortunately the money dried up and he had to leave school and he could do crime. Um, he went to jail for not a very long time, but jail for all of the people that I photographed, except people like Blitz, Margaret Felk, I just showed you, was a very bad place to be, and uh, he was sworn off um, crime forever. My experience with people that I have photographed is that invariably they want to go straight. But going straight is extremely difficult because at the best of times, if you're a young person in South Africa now, um, particularly if you're black or colored, uh, getting a job is almost a fruitless exercise. If in addition to that you have a record, you're buggered. There's very little you can do. Um, and my experience is that most of these people want desperately to go straight. They sometimes form companies together with others, building companies, and, uh, and investment companies, uh, but they have no capital, they have no skills, and they have very little real hope of getting anywhere. Um, this is Ellen Puckis. Ellen Puckis was born to parents who were homeless, and she was abused sexually more or less from the time she was four years old. Um, her parents, when she was 11 years old, took in a known rapist, and because he was able to supply them with liquor and uh, put him into bed with her. Uh, by the time she was, she went on the streets, eventually became a prostitute. Um, by the time she was 18, she had had, uh, I think, two children. Anyway, eventually at the age of 28, she married um, a steady man and had a child. And she strangled his, her child here on this bed. Um, he had um, become addicted to tuk. I'm not sure what the official name is for tuk, but it's a highly addictive and dangerous drug. And um, she, she said he, he, he robbed them of everything that he could. He cut out the copper tubes from their plumbing. He took their curtains, their linen, their, their, their protection gate. He, he robbed them blind. And eventually one day she broke and she took a rope and she strangled him. He was sleeping on this bed. Um, the judge was very sympathetic to her and gave her a suspended sentence and some compulsory community hours, uh, which she served, which she had served when I met her. And um, she, uh, she continued to serve the community, particularly looking after children or, or helping parents with children who were addicted. I have to tell you that in order to make an appointment to meet her, the person who was conducting me had to make a preliminary visit to a gang leader to get um, safe passage for us. We had to pay the gang leader in order to get safe passage. There's a gang war in this part of the Cape Flats. This is Paul Tuchy, um, whose father went to jail for a few years for robbery when, when his mother was pregnant with him. Um, a life of broken family and very little else. Um, he and a friend decided to rob a house in a neighboring town to Johannesburg. A neighboring town because they had been told or knew that the burglar alarms in that town, the Benoni, were not, uh, didn't have batteries. So if you managed to disconnect the burglar alarm, it would not sound if you broke in. Whereas in Johannesburg, we have a more sophisticated breed of radio burglar alarms. Um, they robbed a house and were seen by a gardener working across the road. They made their way to the local ra railway station. The, the, uh, the observant gardener reported them to the police or to a security company, and they were caught at the railway station, put into the back of a pickup by the, um, by the police, taken back to the scene of crime, 
and they had stolen, they managed to get a pistol during the, the robbery and during the break-in and Paul, the young man here, had tucked the pistol into his waistband and it hadn't been seen by the cop who arrested him. So as the policeman opened the back door to the pickup, Paul took his shot him. Uh, and he and his and his mate made a break and ran for it. Uh, they took shelter here in, uh, in a, a gully next to a, a local lake and were hiding there when they heard the police with dogs and realized that it was hopeless and they gave themselves up. He went to prison <coughs> and um, when I met him, he was again like for those trying to go straight. This is Henny Gerber. Henny Gerber was a policeman. Uh, served, he became a policeman in the dog unit in South Africa, served on the Botswana border, served in what was in Rhodesia, came back to South Africa and eventually left the police and became the chief security officer of a security company in South Africa. Um, he, the, 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 uh, the headquarters where he worked was robbed by some men with AK-47s and 4.5 million rand was stolen. And he suspected a young man by the name of um, Samuel Kahan. Samuel didn't yield to questioning, so Henny, together with two other ex-cops, white men, and a couple of black men, took him to a plantation in the south of Johannesburg near Mindon. <coughs> there was a tree there, a blue gum tree, over which they had, before, on other occasions when they had suspects, thrown a rope. And this tree, when I photographed Henry unfortunately was cut down but it's probably one of those stumps there. Um, they threw their rope over the branch and, um, uh, and then suspended Samuel by his feet. They kept him there the whole day suspended by his feet with his head about a meter above the ground. They lit a fire under his head to help him inhale smoke. Uh, they took him down occasionally to get the circulation going again. They drank alcohol, and he told me you can't do this kind of work if you don't get this. Um, and eventually they took him down. He hadn't given them anything that was useful. And one of the other policemen shot this young man in the shoulder. Henny realized that there was now, this was now, they were dealing now with damaged goods, they couldn't take him back. And he shot him in the back and killed him. Uh, one of the men then took the body away and burnt it, and uh, they left. Subsequently, Henny fell out with one of these two policemen, had an argument in the bar, and the policeman gave him, gave him away. Henny was taken to court and accused of murder. Uh, he went to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission that we had at that time in South Africa, which was examining people who had committed political crimes in order to see whether they were worth giving um, amnesty. The TRC refused to give any amnesty. Uh, they reckoned that this was not a politically motivated crime, albeit that Henny had claimed that the money was due to go to the PAC, the Liberation Movement. And so Henny went to jail. He sat in jail for 14 years. Um, it's interesting, almost all of the people that, that I've been talking about and that I have photographed had not, been, had not been back to the scene of crime during the time that they were in prison or since they had committed the crime. So this was his first visit here. And I think that what happens, or what has happened on, in several of these uh, occasions where I've photographed these people is that there is a kind of catharsis, I think, and a moment of reflection, I suppose, and the bitterness and the coming to terms with what was a very um, embittering experience. 
Annie today is a private investigator. He, he considers me to be a very good friend. He calls me Darby May O'Flint, which means David, my old friend. Um, Davy, my old friend. Um, and this here is a lesbian couple, Bridget, Bridget and Noomsa. Bridget and Noomsa, they're no longer partners. When I photographed them, they had already split up. But at that time, we're going back some years, uh, they went to visit um, Noomsa's sister, who lived in Soweto, in the backyard of this house. They, sat, they spent the Saturday afternoon drinking beers and chatting. There was a young man living in the same yard in a room, and he questioned Bridget about being a lesbian and told her that he thought that she needed a real man to give her a different view on, on sex. Uh, that night, quite late, they went to bed, and Lumsa and Bridget shared the bed of the sister. During the, during, while they were sleeping, Lumsa, uh, sorry, Bridget felt her underclothes being pulled down. And she nudged her partner and said, don't be stupid, you can't do it here. And in fact, she discovered that it was this young man. He was about to perform what is known as corrective rape. And there, were, there ensued a fight, a battle. Um, Lumsa, uh, Bridget, found an iron rod. Well, first, first he stabbed Noomsa in the neck. Noomsa ran off into the night. Bridget found an iron bar and knocked the young man unconscious. Anyway, to cut a long story short, um, she was called to the police station the next day. And she thought she was going to lay a charge against uh, this young man. But in fact, the lady of the house laid a charge of theft against her. She claimed that, that they had stolen her television set. Uh, to keep the peace, Bridget agreed to pay off the television set that she had to stone. A few weeks later, or a couple of weeks later, Bridget and Nunsa went to a party in Pretoria and spent the weekend in Pretoria, came back and was called to the police station again. The lady had now laid a charge of armed robbery against Bridget. And what ensued was that Bridget was taken to court, accused of armed robbery. The defense attorney that was assigned from the Defense League of Aid was uh, a friend of the investigating officer. He didn't call a single witness. No case was made for, for Bridget, and she was sentenced to 10 years in prison. This was obviously a terribly bitter blow to her. She was a promising young woman and had a a job in a very big corporation where they were going to give her a course in design. Anyway, she, um, she went to jail and while in jail she did a course in law and realized that she can, could perhaps help herself. And she wrote an appeal and went through the process of getting the appeal registered, went to court and the three judges took a look at her story and within 10 minutes told her that there was no case to answer and she was acquitted. Um, today she's working in an organization dealing with um, family matters. And this young man, Longa, is an object lesson in my, in the danger of what I'm doing. Um, he had shot at the policeman on this, on this railway bridge three times in the chest and thought that he had murdered him, killed him, ran away. The policeman was wearing a bulletproof vest and uh, Lunga was then wanted for attempted murder. And I recorded Lunga's story as I did everybody else's and paid him his 800 grand and that encouraged Lunga. He then took off. He was then in a rehabilitation course with a, with a an organization that had introduced me to him and has not been seen since. He's wanted by the police. Um, are we taking too much time? No, no it's fascinating. fascinating. Okay, because <coughs> I now go to another set of pictures. Um, there is a proliferation of um, post-apartheid public sculpture 
in our cities. Johannesburg in particular, Cape Town, and I'm, I've still to investigate others. So I've been photographing some of this sculpture. I think there's, there's, there's something very interesting happening with this work. Um, this is a, what amounts to a little herd of cattle, sculpted, beautifully sculpted, at a taxi rank in Johannesburg. Um, cattle, as you probably know, are a very important um, asset in many African societies because uh, they form the bride price if a man wishes to get married. So these cattle are, are, very, are venerated, I think, by the local people. There has been no vandalism of any of them. Um, sometimes I've found that washing has been hung on their horns, but uh, that, that's about it. Um, William Kentridge and his friend Howard Marx have made a sculpture that's really quite an extraordinary thing. It's called the Firewalker. It consists of a number of apparently disparate <coughs> plates of metal, black and white metal, and only from one position or two pos from very close up do you realize that this is actually a woman walking with a brazier on her head. This is this <coughs> used to be a common sight in Johannesburg. It still happens. Um, women will um, get a tin, knock holes in the sides, and fill it with coal and get it going up to a nice heat. And they'll then find themselves a position on a sidewalk and they'll roast uh, mealies, corn. And you can buy yellow corn, you can buy yellow mealies on the street. Um, so that's William Kentridge's and Herod Marx's sculpture. That's the city. And the title of this picture is The City the firewalker and the evidence of cable theft. What you see in the foreground is what's left after some, some thieves had cut a cable running into one of these poles, tied it to a rope and simply, and then to a pickup, to a bucky, and then towed and pulled the, the cable up and, and cut it loose. Uh, that's quite a common thing in South Africa. Huge, huge costs to the to the economy. Uh, this is a private piece of sculpture. It, it's it's in Soweto, and the man living in one of these houses has is busy making a, a menage um, of sculptures. And this is his elephant. This is John Forster Square, as we used to know it. That was the central police station in Johannesburg and is now called Johannesburg Central. And the sculpture here, this rock with steel bands tightly wrapped around it, commemorates detainees who died in detention in this building, of which there were quite a lot. Uh, now we're into something else. Now we're into our realm. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I, I, I mean, I went into it. Okay. <laughs> David, I think we could we could talk all night about the pictures you just shown, but I just want to bring up one yeah. um, thing I've noticed, which is it, obviously I've followed your practice very carefully, and I'm not sure if the timing was precisely at the end of apartheid, but color entered your work. And I'm not sure if you could say optimism is linked with colour, but I, I wondered just to, to know why the uh, return to black that, and white. Yeah, that's an interesting question. Uh, it's a very subjective and I, a thing, and I wouldn't claim to that it's a philosophy, but during the years of apartheid, I did a lot of colour work professionally for magazines and advertising and things like that, but almost nothing in my personal <coughs> work was in colour. Came the end of apartheid, um, there, were, there was a delay of a few years before I started working again with personal work because I had to finish off a big project. But from about 1999, 2000, I started working in color. And this was really a, a feeling of liberation and of wanting to um, enjoy what had happened. Um, I now, I've now gone back to black and white, as you've seen. And I think that Partly this is because I, want, I enjoy black and white and I wanted these particular subjects, I think, blend themselves to black and white. But it's also because, frankly, I'm very, I'm very worried about South Africa and depressed about what's happening. Yeah. Right. The other thing that I found listening to you <coughs> recount these stories of these engagements 
is the idea that the photograph emerges out of a conversation um, and the kind of relationship between the words, between you and your subjects, and then the final picture. And I was very struck in the exhibition downstairs, um, the presence of words in relationship to the images. And there, there seem to be different kinds of texts. There's, um, there's some titles that feel almost literary. So um, I'm thinking of The Farmer's Wife, for example, which feels like a, a Roman club, a short story, perhaps. Um, and then there's, and then there's uh, titles that feel more sort of quasi-scientific. They're almost, uh, I'm thinking of um, Boss Boy, in which you describe, we're looking at a picture of a man's torso, and you describe all the elements you can see, a knife, a pipe, a watch, etc. And then you've got these other much longer, really strikingly intimate texts that you've included in the show. Um, and, and I found them really beautiful, beautifully written. And I just wanted to read an extract from one of them, um, because it relates to, to a question that I wanted to ask you. Um, you. You write, I needed to grasp something of what a man is and is becoming in all his particularity, of himself and his bricks and bit of earth and of this place, and to contain all this in a photograph. To do this, and to discover the shapes and the shades of his loves and fears, and, all, and, of, and of my own would be enough. Um, but yet, I wonder if there, it is enough, because the picture doesn't just sit there on its own. The picture sits there with these other words. And, and I was just really interested to ask you how you see your pictures relating to the words that seem to accompany them. Yeah. Thank you, Nick. That's a, um, it's an ongoing uh, process, words and pictures and what words to use, how to write them. I, I sweat blood when I write, and yet I know that with some of the photographs I have to write because, not, not because I feel insecure about the pictures, but because I know that they need to be given a context. The context is partly the external context of South Africa. The, I, I work only in South Africa except for one thing that I'm going to tell you. Um, I, there, there is that external context, and there is the context of myself and of how I relate to the pictures. And that, that, uh, those few lines that you just read actually summarize all of that, because um, it means that I was attempting somehow in the photograph, and uh, I didn't say it, but in the words, to give a context which was that external reality, that man and his earth, and and so on and it also and his loves and fears and of my own that's very important my own loves and fears um, because I'm deeply involved in that and so very often I, I would um, photograph somebody particularly in the course of that work of that particular essay some Afrikaners and I was fearful of what I was seeing and experiencing because there was a there were, there were forces at work that were very uh, disturbing. So these things are, are paramount to me, and, and I always insist when I show work on having my words with the pictures, not in a piece of paper remotely controlled as it were, but, but on the wall next to the picture. I want that interaction of the eye and the, 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 the viewer's eye and, and understanding to happen between the picture and the text. I mean, I, I noticed something walking around the exhibition, which was it's almost a cliche how we all talk about when we look at our family albums and you have pictures from before you were cognizant and they're almost injected memories that you have of life that you couldn't have known at first hand. And just walking around, I mean, your books are always wandering around in friends' houses and the images downstairs I've seen over and over again. And it's almost a similar experience, they're kind of it's less of a question than a thank you, just because for embedding those memories of a country that I would never have had access to firsthand. Um, but also for the kind of political consciousness that they, they embedded in me. And also a love and a fear of this medium of photography that we were engaged in. Um, it just leads me to another thing. I'm not sure how much Kate was aware in, in inviting us to talk with you 
the extent to which we share things besides just the medium of photography, all coming from Lithuanian Jewish blood. And Ali and I did a number of trips to Rwanda where we met a remarkable woman who was interviewing a lot of genocide victims and perpetrators. And she had a theory that survivors of genocide or trauma um, have one of two kind of responses to injustice that they encounter. One is to just hide away and pretend it's not existing. And the other is to be very outspoken about it. And I know my parents are here, so I'm not going to get too personal, but the, the, the response to injustice that we encountered as children and as young adults in South Africa was a site of particular, um, you know, it was, was a very difficult thing in our family. And I just want to know how being both a survivor and at the same time in a position of real power for the first time, because as a white person, probably for the first time in centuries as a Jew, you were, you were in a position of power. So how that influenced your, your practice? Yeah, thank you. Um, I can't claim to have felt that I was a survivor. I was a very fortunate person. I was brought up in a class white family, quite secure. We, we never lacked for, for any of the basics in our home. And um, I was never maltreated. So I, I was not a survivor. But I did imbibe, I think, through my parents, my brothers, and, and uh, the little new world that we lived in, uh, a very powerful sense of, of, um, of revulsion at injustice. And I can't put it more strongly than that. Um, I can, it, it, it went way back to my early childhood and has remained. And so I'm sure that that has been um, uh, an important factor in the way I work. Yeah. Um, Adam, a few years ago, Adam and I got, were invited commissioned by the Constitutional Court to, to come to South Africa. Um, and, and make a sort of survey of the country post-apartheid, 10 years after the end of apartheid. Um, and it was a great opportunity for us because it was really the first time that we had come back and you know, started to take photographs in South Africa. Um, and we encountered um, a man, a guy called Mr. McKeese on our travel, um, who was a, a black migrant worker um, in a hostel in Johannesburg. Um, and his story really struck us because he'd been, and we write about this in the book that we subsequently made, he'd been photographed three times in his life. Um, the first time was for his passport, which is the notorious document that controlled the movements of um, non-white uh, South Africans around South Africa during apartheid. Uh, and the second time was for his uh, part, for his ID, for his for the first democratic election, so he could vote. And then the third time was this photograph that we took, which was not for anything really. I mean, it didn't have any sort of use value. Um, and and the story of these three photographs um, intrigued us because they alluded to a history of a of a struggle, the struggle against apartheid, and also concurrently the history of photography and the way the two things sort of slide between each other. And we've recently been doing um, a lot of research into the relationship between photography and race um, for our new show and um, uh, some work that we're doing. And we discovered something really extraordinary that um, in, the, in the 80s, um, Polaroid um, supplied the apartheid government with equipment to produce the images to make the portraits for the passports. And there was, um, there was a young photographer, a, a black American photographer, who worked for Polaroid at the time, who discovered this. And he began a campaign to try to uh, inspire Polaroid to withdraw from South Africa. Um, and again, that story kind of really struck um, a chord with us, that the idea that somehow the history of this country was intertwined with the history of this medium, in a way. Um, so, um, what's my question? Um, <laughs> I mean, I want to read another extract from one of your one of your texts because I think um, it's I think it's it's relevant. Um, 
It's from the text that you write about Foxburg, um, and you say, white and black all locked in a system of manic control and profound immorality. Simply to draw breath was to be complicit. Um, and something that Adam and I think a lot about in our work is the way in which photography is complicit in manic systems of control um, and in profound immorality. And whether it's possible, that this, this is a bit of a convoluted question, but um, we're using a medium that is also used to control and to, um, and to oppress. And is it possible to escape that with this medium? Well, I think that it must be acknowledged that almost any technological development that you can think of has been put to use by those who would oppress, those who would uh, corrupt, those who would torture, um, from the way that steam engine powered um, the engines that uh, powered the city of London at a time when you could be sent to Australia for stealing a loaf of bread. I, I, there, there are any number of examples of it. And personally, I can't get my knickers in the knot about, <laughs> about the idea that um, uh, Kodak and its film, and the films that I took great delight in using, was also the supplier of materials to the South African security forces. Um, at one stage, uh, I know, I know for sure that, um, I, I mean, uh, the, the, there was a, a move to, to uh, computerize the, the databases of, of all of these people for control of the population. But this goes right back to the beginnings of photography. Um, identification photographs were a major means of control. It was the first major means of control uh, that enabled police to say, that's the guy, that's the same man that we caught doing this and that, because they're the photographs on record. And so the medium has been put to that use almost from its beginning. And um, the fact that, uh, that a camera or a medium can be used for quite different purposes um, is to me simply a fact of life. Uh, this goes back, I suppose, to, to um, a more searching question that was raised by Susan Sonte, that um, the camera is a, me is a means of aggression, uh, that the terminology of 35 millimeter photography is riddled with sexual uh, um, uh, implications and, and we, we had a session at Witz in Johannesburg where she, she faced a battery of photographers and I, and I said to her do you not concede that the camera can be used like the penis as a means of love and she had to acknowledge that there was a, this was a, a hyperbolic statement of her, by her in that book which I think was very harmful because it, it, it <coughs> kind of triggered a whole generation of people who were afraid to lift the camera because shooting meant something mm. uh, that was... Uh, maybe, not maybe, maybe just to add a part two to oh. this question, which is maybe more specific. Photography is also notoriously unstable. And I'm thinking of your first show in London in mm. the 70s mm. of, I, I presume, some of this work. Yeah. And I'd just like to know how it was read because Maybe that also alludes to its instability. That's a very important question, because at that time, you could have heard a pin drop in London, as far as my show was concerned. It was totally unnoticed, except by two elderly men from the, from the Jewish newspaper <laughs> who walked around taking detailed notes, <laughs> and, then, and then wrote a review in which they said, clearly, Mr. Gomez supports apartheid. <laughs> <laughs> and the reason that they was, and their stated reason was, that among these photographs, there was a photograph that I had done in Soweto in the home of a black doctor, a little matchbox house, traditional Soweto house. And in the, in the, the living room, his two sons were practicing the violin. And this to them indicated that I supported apartheid because I was showing black people who were not on the bones of their ups and, and, and starving, they were actually practicing the violin. So these complexities 
have a whole range of of um, fascinating and uh, sometimes quite devastating implications because people can completely misread the photographs depending on where they're coming from in their, in their own culture and context. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I was wondering before I visited the show whether Kate, how, she, how it was going to be structured and whether it would be a real minestrone and you could mix all the pictures together or each artist was separate. Mm. I hope you don't mind, but I've just tried yeah. to do that here. And obviously the picture on the left is your the, the farmer's son and his mm. nursemaid. And on the right is Ernest Cole's image from Riverside. And I think uh, on the surface, very similar images, but profoundly different. And I think <coughs> Just for me personally, the, the, to compare them is quite interesting and gives me an insight into your practice or what, yeah. I, what I feel is a part of a practice, yeah. which in Ernest's work, there's a sense of kind of urgency and a need to capture an event, a moment, a piece of evidence that's quite very, that speaks very clearly. Um, and your work quite consistently feels like it has a level of detachment, coolness, consideration, even conceptualism to it. And I just think, I, I'm wondering about how you see, you, co you compare your practice to, yeah. to Ernest. And yeah, yeah. yeah. And I think this is a very interesting uh, theory that you've made. I need to say something about the, and that relates, again, to what you're asking me, it relates to what um, was happening in South Africa. Here are two versions of really the same phenomenon, love, affection. <coughs> this white man was in a shabine. He was actually a traffic cop, I think. And he was in a shabine, an illegal drink drinking place. And the woman is actually very tenderly um, helping him through his drunkenness. There is a picture from that series that wasn't, that isn't in the show where he has his hand on the breast of one of these women. This is what uh, Ernest, I think, had to flee the country for because these photographs would have landed him in very serious trouble with the authorities. The picture on the left is a situation that was pregnant, if you don't mind me funny on that, um, pregnant with a South African situation, the black-white sexual situation. Here is love between a young black woman who's, who's the, the, the little boy's nursemaid and the boy. And the two of them clearly have a very affectionate relationship. What, has, what, what was implicit in this is what happened when the boy became pubic, when he, when he became adolescent. He had to know, he had to learn that he would no longer be able to touch a black woman in that way because that would lead inevitably to immorality in big quotes, and six months in jail. Um, so these two situations are very, very interestingly uh, compared here. I think that Ernest was concerned, as you say, with a great deal of urgency. Uh, it runs right through his work. Um, and yet, I would submit that he was much more than simply a recorder of the urgent moments of apartheid. He was a very considering and considered photographer. He, his, his work is very carefully composed. And um, his, his idol, if you like, was Kati Brisson. <coughs> his immediate mentor, and I think a man that he admired a great deal, was Stuart Robertson, a, South African, a Canadian South African photographer, who did very fine work and I'm sure it was, influence, was an influence in, in Ernest's work too. So there was urgency, but that urgency I think came from, from the very circumstances in which he had to work. He, um, he was <coughs> always up against the, the risk of discovery and authority and so on. And um, I'm sure he, he worked very often with a hidden camera. Uh, I, on the other hand, worked obliquely. I didn't photograph things that the, the regime regarded as dangerous, as uh, um, terrorism. I photographed 
things that were very orderly, orderly events. Yeah, like that. Yes. Yeah. And they couldn't understand what I was doing. Uh, I mean, when I photographed in Boxburg, uh, if, you, if you go to the exhibition, there are a couple of photographs on the street. For three days, I stood on the street, that complex of street corners, four street corners. For three days, I stood there for hours on end, just photographing the occasional passerby. A white man stood a few meters away from me, watching all the time. He never once spoke to me. I'm sure he's from the security police. <laughs> he, he couldn't understand what the hell I was doing. <laughs> so, to, you know, to me, sorry, would you go back yeah. please, I mean, to that photograph? This photograph is, is about the un, untrammeled, un, unrestricted taking over of the land by white people in South Africa. No black person in an urban area could do this because they were restricted to a prescribed area. They could not live outside that prescribed area. This man, symbolically, if you like, is, is mowing his lawn into infinity. It's what, it's, it's what he, it's essentially what white people were doing. So, um, yes, there is a distance, there is um, a coolness, if you like, a detachment. Um, I think that's partly the way I am is partly to my wish to convey in the most with the least. Um, I can't put it more succinctly than that. Yeah. But there's but there's a sense that despite the fact that the, your pictures tend to be very very controlled and very composed, um, there is this thing with photography that things happen before the lens that sometimes you don't anticipate. Mm. Um, and I think Walter Benjamin referred to this thing of the optical unconscious. This is the stuff that happens in front of the camera that you, you don't predict. And we've had it a number of times where we've taken pictures and we've gone into the bathroom and we've printed something very big. And it's only then that we've noticed something that's in that picture that we didn't intend to be there, but actually is makes the picture. And I want, one of the things we wanted to ask you is, has that happened to you in your practice? No, it continually happens. <laughs> And, I, and I've, I've, I've now reached um, almost a decision. I, I, I never crop anything up in a picture, unless it's a, a total cock up and I have to have something in that picture. But I very seldom crop anything up because I love the, the edges of the picture where marginal things have crept in that I wasn't consciously aware of at the time of taking, but which add to the richness of the stew. And um, yeah, that, to me that's that's a very important aspect. And very often, uh, I'm certainly not a, a sort of Cartier Bresson uh, decisive moment kind of photographer. But very often, when I've set up my four by five camera, something just happens. That's like a moment of grace, mm -hmm. a, a mm -hmm. grace note when something just somebody walks into the picture or something happens and. And it just makes the picture. But of course, equally, something happens in the brother's <laughs> <laughs> Um I just wanted to read a little short caption from the press release of the show. Um, it goes, the world changed dramatically in the 60s and 70s, from the Cultural Revolution to the Cold War, from America's colonialist misadventure in Vietnam to the indelible values of civil rights movement. This was the defining period of the modern age. It also coincided with the golden age of photography, the moment when the medium flowered as a modern art form. Um, now, for me, as a young child in, you know, in the 70s and 80s, growing up under cultural boycott, um, South Africa felt like a parallel universe. It certainly doesn't match up to that description. Yeah. And I just wondered what it was like driving your bicycle into Soweto every day you know, for six months, and what it was like to be operating in that parallel universe. <laughs> a correction, I didn't drive a bicycle into Soweto. Um, I had a 4x4 four four truck. Right. <laughs> <laughs> where, where, where did you go? I, I rode the bicycle into Fitos, which right. is a little suburb in Indian suburb. Um, yeah, I, I must tell you secretly that Kate is quite wrong. This, <laughs> what was, was happening in South Africa in the 60s and 70s was not everything is moving everything was coming to a standstill. Yeah. 
this was the triumphant moment of apartheid and the government was enforcing its, its increasingly complicated uh, legal system to to freeze us almost in a state of into into a state of um, separation that they idealized. Um, so I, you know, I I I think that in South Africa that South Africa was, as you just put it, the parallel universe. It was different. It was not the same as what was happening in the rest of the world. So we've, we've um, created another pairing here, this time with uh, an image that's not in, in the show. Um, yeah, from the Congo. That's yeah. from the Congo, yeah. And this obviously is one of your images that we've both kind of had kind of ingrained in our yeah. brains since yeah. we first saw it. Um, but, the pic but that picture, um, yes, it, it's... Um, the Congo reform movement was really the first um, human rights movement that incorporated photography as a tool for campaigning against human rights issues. Um, and so this picture is really, it's not a photograph, it's a piece of evidence of a human rights abuse. Um, and the story is well known that during the Congo, King Leopold exchanged bullets with hands as evidence of uh, that the bullets had been used. Um, and so this picture attempts to communicate that. It's a piece of evidence. Um, and the picture was actually used in a text by Mark Twain. And it comes back to Kodak again, weirdly. Um, but um, Mark Twain writes, assuming the, the persona of King Leopold, um, the Kodak has been a sole calamity to us, the most powerful enemy indeed. In the early years, we had no trouble in getting the press to expose the tales of mutilation as slanders, lies, inventions. Yet all things went, uh, yes, all things were harmonious and pleasant in those good days. Then all of a sudden came the crash, that incorrupt, incorruptible Kodak the only witness I couldn't bribe. Um, and we just wanted, wanted to ask you, do you is, is, does that resonate with your idea about photography uh, as this incorrupt, incorruptible witness, as, as a piece of evidence? Well, it's certainly not incorruptible. I think that it's quite easy to corrupt, as we know. Um, Trotsky was removed from, from one of the pictures that Stalin features in long before Photoshop. And today, with Photoshop, you can corrupt almost anything that you can think of in photographic terms. But certainly, photography as evidence, to me, is, uh, you know, it's, it's unequaled. It's, it's got a, an enormously important part to play in, in history and in, um, in current affairs. Uh, and during this period in the 80s in South Africa, uh, several of us used to be on call almost to, to lawyers who were documenting cases of torture where we go out somewhere and photograph somebody who'd been lashed with a shambok. Um, and those photographs were then used in evidence in court. So to me, um, I go beyond this. I regard, you, you said that's not a photograph. You see, I dispute that. That is a photograph. I, I regard all photographs as documents. Fashion, uh, a photograph taken by a, a CCTV camera somewhere in this in this complex, um, a photograph taken by a, a, an automatic camera in a bank of a robbery, um, a Richard Abbott on portrait, any of them, all of them are documents. I don't think that there is a reason to distinguish between them in a truly fundamental sense, because as we know, a photograph like that one on uh, on the left on that side of the screen, can become regarded, can come to be regarded as high art. You guys might incorporate that in one of your, of your uh, installations, and it becomes a piece of work that you, that you sell in the London art market. And so it's, there, there are no limits, in my opinion, and no restrictions. All photographs are part of the evidence of our passing. I just I wanted to end just with a quite a personal question, but um, which is how you manage to <coughs> kind of um, succeed to live as as a father, as a partner, and as a photographer, which often to me feels like quite contradictory roles. Um, but actually, I had a lovely conversation with Brenda who brought it today, and she answered it. But she answered it so elegantly that I just want to re repeat yeah, some of what she said. <laughs> but she did say that I asked her something along those lines, and she said that you 
consistently not forced them but encouraged your children to open their eyes and to look around critically and you did it through photography but you also spoke that to them and I think she felt very grateful to that mm. so it seems like you did a good job of it. Well I'm, I'm grateful to her that <laughs> <laughs> she could no doubt have said a lot of other things. <laughs> <laughs> Children wanted a swimming pool, and I refused to give it to you. She did tell me that. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, yeah, look, um, there were times, and there are still times, when being a photographer is in conflict with being a domesticated person, uh, a, a husband, a father. Um, I think that I was very fortunate. My wife and, <coughs> and our three children were extraordinarily co uh, tolerant of what I was doing. And, and you know, I, I go off on, on journeys and not not be home. And uh, when I was home, I was, I suppose, often ill-tempered because um, I'd spoiled a piece of film or something like that. And um, yeah, but these are the costs, I suppose, of doing what I do. And. Um, Perhaps one shouldn't become a father, and one shouldn't have children if you're going to do this kind of work. I don't know. It's a balance. It's a balancing act. <laughs> yeah. But the, and the, maybe just before we open up to the to the audience, just to thank you again for for the legacy that is so moving and so profound. Yeah, thank you. Thank, so thank you very much. Mm. I think it's also really important to mention something else. Brenda said is that your consistent and very quiet support to the photographic community in South Africa, mm. giving son to Mofokin a camera when he was stolen and opening up your dark room and the market workshop. I think, I think it's largely due to you that there's such a strong and remarkably strong photographic uh, I, I, I want to correct something here. I've certainly been encouraging and, I, and I've done little things here and there, but I don't want that somewhere in the something that somebody has written, I'm, I'm credited with far more than, than is due. Um, one mustn't forget that in the 80s in particular, in the mid-80s, a new generation of young photographers came up. These were highly politicized, radical, energetic photographers. Very good in, 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 in the trade, as it were. They, were. they were good photographers, and they did very courageous things. And so, um, I think that we built up almost, a, a, I don't want to exaggerate it, but a, a kind of um, uh, ambience in which real issues were important to photographers. And so I think that, that has carried through. Um, uh, and People have gone on to do other things. There is a lady in the audience here tonight, Leslie Dawson, who did extraordinary work in the 80s on, on working women and and, uh, and, what, and on white society. Um, and I, I don't think that this should be should be in any way minimised. So I, yes, I did help some photography, but I, I don't. I really don't think that it should be made such a central issue, it's not so. Thank you. I think maybe we should um, open up to the audience yeah. some questions. Uh, if anyone's got a question, maybe just put your hand up and we'll bring you a mic. Um, you, especially with the photographs that are behind you, you were talking about photographs being used as evidence, or any of yours ever used as evidence in the yeah. Truth and Reconciliation Commission? Yes, yes, certainly. Um, I, I was one of a group of photographers who, who photographed uh, evidence for case for law, you know, for, for lawyers who were taking cases to court and torture. Um, I haven't shown any of those. This, this photograph arose out of that association. There was, a, there was an organization called the Detainees Parents Support Committee. Um, it was illegal to help detainees. But if you were a parent, you could help. So this organization called itself the Detainees Parents Support Committee. And they did a great deal of important work in, uh, in helping people who had been in detention and who had been tortured. 
and, and I had an arrangement with them that if somebody came into their offices who they thought might be of interest to me as, as a photographer of, because I wanted to document this, um, they would phone me, and, and on this occasion they phoned me about this young man who had been held by the police having had his hands kicked into his wrists when he was arrested. He was dragged out of bed, and while he was being dragged, one of the cops kicked his hands, both of them, into, so that the hand went into the forearm. And um, during his detention, the police gave no medical aid at all, not even an aspirin. And um, subsequently, when he was released, uh, he was brought to Johannesburg, and he had just been seen by an orthopedic surgeon. Thank you, David. There are so many questions to ask, but you alluded at the beginning to, um, well, you talked about the fact that you've only made work in South Africa, but you alluded to the fact that you're about to make a new body of work somewhere else. And I wondered what, what is that body, what's prompted you to work outside of South Africa? You're talking about the new body of work that I'm going to do? <laughs> <laughs> um, there is an organization called Multi-Story working out of West Bromwich in what I think is called the Black Country. And they have commissioned four photographers, uh, Martin Power, Susan Marcellus, Mark Power, and me. And they've also commissioned, I think, uh, one or two filmmakers and writers to tell stories about the black country. And uh, they invited me to join, and I went up there and looked around, I was shown around, and decided that I didn't really want to photograph the place, not having been born there, uh, but that I would like to extend the project on ex-offenders at the scene of crime. So um, I'll be spending a month up there after I've finished here, and I hope I'll do the same thing. Um, it's just an extension, actually, on that last question. Um, I've been working recently with both Adam and Ollie in, in Gabon, in Central Africa. And it's just to ask you to expand a little on the qualification of photographers going into another place and observing it, what that qualification is, and indeed what the limits are and why it's so important that you work from home. Yeah, um, I have a problem, and it's a very personal thing. Um, I find that in foreign places, that is places outside South Africa, I am often very interested in what I'm seeing, but I'm very conscious of the fact that I'm a foreigner. Uh, not because people make me feel foreign or, or unwelcome, but simply the fact that... I, mean, I went to Madagascar in 1968 on a, on a magazine assignment, and I was astonished that children this high were speaking French, and I didn't know a word of French. <laughs> it, it, it's an, a very elementary thing, but it, it hit me very hard that I was totally foreign. Um, and so I find <coughs> that I will go into a place, another place, on a, on a professional commission perhaps, uh, but even there, I'm, when I was doing that sort of work, I would be very careful to only to accept an assignment that I felt I could handle with a reasonable de degree of of coherence. Um, but I find that I can't go into foreign places and, I mean, the city of London I was commissioned to photograph in 1968 and for three weeks I walked around feeling more and more hopeless because <laughs> I realized that, you know, I mean, I would walk into a courtyard and there'd be a pub that had been going for 300 years and I had no, no entry, entry points to these things. So I'm very reluctant to go into another place um, and do a personal piece of work. Uh, other photographers don't have this problem, and Adam and Ollie apparently don't, and I respect that. But yeah, it's, it's a personal idiosyncrasy. There is only one other place that I've been to where I've done what was really a personal piece of work, and that was in Western Australia. Uh, I had become interested in the subject of blue asbestos, and there was a blue asbestos mine way up in the bush and um, 
uh, I had a commission from the Art Gallery of Western Australia to do some photography and I elected to go there and I did an essay about that place. But that and the work that I'm going to do in the black country uh, are the only what I regard as personal pieces of work that I've done outside of South Africa. It's interesting you say that because for me, uh, when we were doing the Mr. McKeezy project, going into Alexandra Township was one of the most foreign places I've ever been. Yeah. And I grew up 200 meters from it. Yeah. And that was my tragedy. But it's, yeah. you know, so I think in, in some ways you've traveled you know, you've crossed many, many borders. But let me say this, that if you had stayed in South Africa, mm -hmm. you might not have stayed living 200 meters from Alex, but you might have, you, you would have had a knowledge, a sense of the place that no foreigner can have. Sure. And yes, I, I don't speak an African language to my shame. I don't speak Zulu or Koza or any of the, of the African languages. We have 11 official languages. I speak some Afrikaans and I speak English. So I'm, I'm ashamed of this, but it doesn't, in my opinion, disqualify me from a kind of empathetic approach and an understanding of what, of what I see around me that I would submit people who come from outside and find difficult to have. Actually, just I'd kind of like to follow up on that too, and because you talk about um, not understanding a place like sort of the, the, the pub in London and so on, or, or you, Adam, the same thing about a physical space. And I'm thinking about the photograph that was in your exhibition back in the 60s in London that was, and you would, or you said it was misinterpreted, it, it was read by an audience, <clears throat> and perhaps the the power, of it, it, there's, a, there's always a tension between the realism in a photograph and its expressive power. And perhaps what makes a photograph um, gain that power is that it references things that exist outside of the photograph. It, 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 perhaps even things that are not things, there are ideas and culture and so on. And I wonder whether, as you, in your work, how much the ability to communicate with and speak to a specific audience informs how you work, that, 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 um, that the photographs mm. exist differently depending on the, the context yeah, in which they show. I hear you, and I think this is, this is for me quite an important thing. I realized around 1968, when I went to the United States with the dummy of my first book, uh, that I I couldn't talk to people outside South Africa uh, simply because they didn't have that kind of knowledge that comes from having been brought up in a place. Um, I would have to explain pictures to the publishers that I went to see, and that was like explaining jokes. They lose their point immediately, whereas a South African would have understood immediately what that photograph was about or had a very good sense of it. So. If I have anybody in mind when I'm photographing, it's first of all myself, but secondly, it's my compatriots. And um, forgive my rudeness, but I don't think of you guys at all. <laughs> <laughs> However, let me say this, that since the 80s, when television went into so many homes and told so much about South Africa, it has become much easier to communicate with people outside South Africa. I had an exhibition at the Photographer's Gallery again in 1985, and it was quite a different thing. There was a lot of interest and quite a lot of uh, uh, searching discussion about the photograph. South Africa six years ago. I'm sorry, I can't hear I, you. I left South Africa six years ago and grew up in Cape Town. And I can understand what you mean, because when I saw your pictures of the um, offenders, I knew immediately who was from Johannesburg, who was from Cape Town, who was from the Cape Flats, and I think it just adds that whole different cultural sense yeah. and meaning, and that I feel perhaps I can understand as a South African, and yeah. you can, and maybe other people don't know. Yeah. yeah. yeah I, I, I mean, this is, this is almost inherent in photography.
Um, I saw those photographs of the offenders in Venice last year. I think they were shown them in Venice. Mm. And I found them very moving, and I read the stories, and I, I spent a long time looking at them. And it must, I, looking at the show today, does it make you feel that nothing's changed very much? And who's looking at those in South Africa? And is it making, are, are, pe are people's ideas changing because of them? Because they were so, you know, these people had done these crimes, but they were because of terrible things that happened to them. And, and I thought, you know, you're, you're showing that in these photographs which, and the text, but who's looking, you know, are the authorities in South Africa looking? Are people taking notice? Yeah. Again, the, these questions are very well directed, in my opinion. Um, I, frankly, I don't, I don't hold out any hope that my work affects anybody at all. Um, no one is going to do anything that they wouldn't have done otherwise. Maybe, just possibly, there's a percolating effect. And so you see a photograph and it might be one that I've done, or that these guys have done, or that, that somebody else has done. And, Somehow the, bra the brain and the ideas inherent in that picture circulate and percolate and something happens that moves you to move in a direction that you might not have done otherwise. But that's as high as I would put it. I don't, as I don't assume, expect, or hope that I will affect <coughs> this behavior at all. You, ask, you might ask then, why do I do it? Because I've got it. <laughs> I just want to return to this question about, um, I suppose, the kind of communicability of photography that's very specific. Speak up, Kate. Do we have a question, please? <laughs> Am I not right? <laughs> just return to this question about the, sort of, the ability of photography that's conceived very specifically in relation to the place in which it's taken and whether it can communicate or it can't. And I, I'm sort of fascinated by the fact that I know that um, Ajay is one of your favourite photographers. So I wonder whether, you know, when you look at Ajay, you feel that you, you're, you're missing a level of understanding in those pictures. Because I would say there's a, it's a counter position to, to what you're saying about the specificity of South Africa, which is that also photographs can have an incredible charge when they are so, um, I don't know, informed by such a deep understanding of the context and the culture in which they come. And I think some of that charge is communicable. And I think these are my favorite photographers are very much sort of based in the place in which you know, they're born and they grow up and so on. So I wonder whether you, tell us what you think about it, actually. That's the question. Well, to me, Ajit was one of the, the very, very great photographers. Um, I find his pictures endlessly inspiring and enjoyable and deep and mysterious. And that in spite of the fact that I don't speak French, I'm not from Paris where he did most of his work, and I've got no doubt at all that I'm missing layer upon layer upon layer of, of stuff that's in those pictures simply because I don't come from Paris and I don't speak French and I don't have a, a knowledge of French history. I've got no doubt of, of that at all. But it's to me one of the great charms and uh, um, perhaps the, uh, um, one of the uh, indicators of his brilliance that in spite of all of that, over all of these years, because he worked between about 1897 and 1927, uh, in spite of all of the things that are missing, photographs are still so eloquent. Um, but yeah, I, I, I acknowledge fully that I'm, I, I have a hero who's, who's very remote from my own culture and knowledge. Um, but to me, he's, he's one of the greatest. You know. Could you tell us more about your experience um, taking photographs under apartheid, like as a white man in Sowoto, and how you did it, what the reactions were, like from the black community towards you? This is one. And the second question I have is about, um, you know, when you take a photograph, you know, the tension between the artistic side of the photograph and the documentary side of it. So how do you go? about it, what do you privilege first? And yeah. yeah. Well, <coughs> let me say immediately that most 
especially during the years of apartheid, I was a highly privileged person. Having a white skin um, and not being, uh, and, and having a sufficient income to work, um, I was a highly privileged person. So there's no question that when I went into black communities, particularly where people who were very poor, um, we were miles apart. And I can't uh, argue that I was I was foreign to them in many ways. Quite possibly they resented me. Quite possibly they hated me. But I can only say that almost invariably I was received with warmth. There were very few occasions on which uh, I, I felt uh, antagonism or antipathy. Um, I think that this is one of the saving graces of South Africa, that in spite of everything that's happened, 300 odd years of, of, of oppression, um, we, we still have a, it's, it's, it's a rapidly diminishing and disappearing, but we still have a very high degree of tolerance of each other. So yeah, I was very lucky. I can't say it any other way. Um, I wish that I could speak the languages and wish that I could approach people with greater um, immediacy and intimacy, but I don't. I haven't got it. Freedom of speech is being compromised in South Africa. Yes. Um, no, unquestionably. Um, the ANC is running very, very frightened. And so they're trying to build up those ramparts in the same way as the apartheid government did. And one of them is to restrict the freedom of speech. And um, so far, um, there's been a sufficient public outcry uh, to make to make such a move as was contemplated in the Protection of Information Bill um, impossible, or not impossible, but very difficult for the government to pass. But I don't hold out that this is going to happen uh, always. Hi, thanks, David. Um, I was actually curious about Sorry, a where, where are you? Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, about a question or comment that was raised earlier at the beginning of the lecture where you sort of said there was just this linear progression from uh, when you started versus sort of your here and now. Um, but I was curious what sort of maybe photographic elements um, I can't see that they weren't sort of real uh, aspects of growth, but I mean, I'm sort of an architect and I do a lot of my own drawing, um, but if you look at a guy like Van Gogh, for instance, and his, his, notion, his notions for painting and his validation was um, sort of looking at his body of work from when he started to when he finished. Uh, I was just curious, I think, as to what sort of elements a photographer is it your eye that really develops or is it really this uh, just integrity or authenticity of what you're capturing has that changed at all or has it remained the same yeah i really do think that i'm i'm a straight line graph in the sense that i expressed it uh, i'm quite boring because throughout this period 60 odd years. My, in my personal work, if, I, if you were to ask me what have I been doing, I've been looking at values in South Africa. I've not always been conscious that I was doing that, but if I look back at the work, that's essentially what I was engaged in, the examination of values. What were our values? What are our values? How did we come to them? And in particular, how do we express them and what is the effect of them? And that's an ongoing an ongoing uh, project, really. Um, along the way, I think that I have become technically somewhat more proficient, but I still make lots of mistakes. Um, but the essentials are, are essentially the same. Um, 
and uh, I, yeah, I find that I'm quite boring. <laughs> I mean, let me say this, that I find Adam and Colin very interesting because they're continually refreshing their, their, uh, their way of looking and what they're doing and seeing. I don't always like what they're doing, but they're continually re yeah, re re refreshing where they are. And uh, I wish I could be the same. Um, looking back to those uh, initial photographs um, but that we saw of the uh, offenders, um, so I'm over here. Uh, I thought it was quite interesting that you paid them 800 grand. Um, what was that money to you? Was it was it ch charity and what was the net? Was that because that's the sort of next step in your artistic control? It's not you well, standing on the side of the street yeah. and calling. Let me say first of all, I I have no use for the word art. It doesn't exist in my vocabulary. I'm concerned with real issues, with real things, real people, and and the effects of, of these things. And I want to. To, I want them to feel that they can that they can be completely open with me, that I'm not self-seeking. So on two scores, I try to do that in a very direct way. I pay for what I'm asking them to do, and I undertake to make no money out of them. And this is a very important aspect of it because if you were to visit South Africa today, and and photograph on the street or in a, in, a, in many parts of the country, the first bit question people will ask you is, are you going to make money out of the photographs? And I want to make it absolutely clear that I'm not. And in this way, I think, first of all, um, that I engage a kind of trust that would be difficult in those circumstances to get. Because here is somebody who's been in prison, been through all the indignities of prison, is still marked by prison, and cannot escape it. So there's a great reluctance on the part of that person to go back into it. And to go back to the scene of crime is a very painful, a very painful thing for us. So I'm, I'm not beholden to anybody. I know that journalistically it's a very bad practice. You shouldn't pay the people that you're interviewing. I'm not beholden to anybody. I say, bugger that, I'll pay people. <laughs> and so I do. Um, and I can say this, that uh, invariably people seem to take this as an opportunity, perhaps for the first time, to tell their story without being judged. I'm not a magistrate, I'm not a social worker, I'm not a policeman, <coughs> I'm not an activist, nothing. I'm simply a guy who's interested in you. And I think this has the effect of, of opening up. I mean, I know of three murders that were committed that have never been charged. Uh, people really do tell me about things. So, yeah, I can't justify it on any noble grounds, but it's, it's what I did. Hi, David. Um, I think your method was beautiful. Um, I think the way that uh, you conducted yourself with, you know, the subjects and, uh, you know, that you paid them, you know, for them to open up and for them to be quite sincere with you. Um, did you ever have a situation where you didn't hate someone and you felt that if you paid them, that you No, I, I, I decided from the beginning when I started this project that I would pay people. Um, it, it seemed obvious to me that I would get nowhere at all if I didn't acknowledge that what I was asking was a very painful thing. Why should somebody go back to the secret crime? It's a very hard thing to yeah, do. Yeah, it's very difficult. Especially if, you, you know, if you've been in, in, inside for 14 years and you've managed to bury that. You, you know, you, you, you don't want to go back there. So I'm asking people to do something very painful. And I also have to acknowledge that 800 bucks is not a huge sum of money, but in South Africa it's not inconsiderable. And for many people, they come out of jail with nothing. So this makes a difference. And I can't deny that for some people, it's the 800 bucks that persuades them to do this. But so be it. Can I ask you what made you decide to do this? sort of photography in the first place? As I said, uh, when, I, when I started this discussion, we have a very high crime rate. And 
it, it affects everybody. There's nobody in South Africa who's not been affected by it, certainly in urban areas. We have burglar alarms, radio burglar alarms. We have uh, um, gear locks on our cars. You can't get insurance unless you have them. Uh, we have um, armed guards, plenty. We pay taxes for police if we don't, for protection that hardly exists, but we pay taxes for it. We, I, I can't begin to enumerate what it costs us to protect our persons and our property. Thank you. Hi. Yeah. Um, I, I left South Africa um, in 2007. <laughs> and um, coming from, I suppose, a middle class white background, I've never really sort of, I suppose, had the intimacy that you have with the, the poorer, our poorer countrymen, so to speak. I was wondering um, what your impression of of this community is now compared to when you were um, sort of photographing them um, during apartheid. So, in effect, what, what post-apartheid um, impoverished society is compared to, to then, are, are they, um, yeah, I, I just what is your impression coming from a sort of similar background to mine? Yeah. I, I think I can say unequivocally, people today are much more questioning. They want to know why I want to take the photograph. And they're much more um, inclined to say no. I don't want to be photographed. Which means there has been a, a very important shift in consciousness because before, it would have been regarded among many black people as simply not done to, it, to refuse the white boss the opportunity to take the photograph. That was the, the power relationship of that kind. And much as I tried not to have that power relationship, I'm sure in many cases it, it existed. Today it's hardly there, but it, you know, it still occasionally rears its head. So, yeah, I think that attitudes have changed quite radically. Uh, I just wanted to ask you, do you give your subjects a copy of your image? I'm terrible about this. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm a wanted man in South Africa. <laughs> I'm hopeless about getting prints to people. And uh, I've made promises for, I'm ashamed to tell you how many. <laughs> but yes, occasionally I do. <laughs> Uh, thank you so thank much. You much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.